I don't know if these slides are supposed to, I gave him to Ben. Ben, Ben, got the slides for this one? Hypersonics? Hypersonics. Yes. Ben's got it. I, uh, I sent it to him this morning. We'll figure it out. Uh, it's full names are right here, sir, at the top. Yes. Yes. I didn't get your thing corrected on this one. I didn't get that one. Colonel Graham, we're good, sir. All right, uh, give me another 60 seconds. Don't mind uh, finding your seats, please, and we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we uh, have the distinct honor of having the uh, Aeronautical Engineering Department with us today uh, to help us present and discuss hypersonics at a, at a uh, more detailed level, uh, level uh, than we've heard so far. And we're looking forward to this panel. So I'd like to introduce uh, first and foremost, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Olmsted uh, from the, uh, from the uh, department. We've got Major General David Scott, uh, uh, retired, uh, currently Deputy Vice President of Advanced Missile Systems at Raytheon Technologies, Dr. Ez Hassan and Dr. Charles Hoke. Uh, I'd like to make note that again, uh, as we've noted before, Raytheon was graciously uh, helping support and put on this uh, symposium. And again, we thank you for the kind gift. And over with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Olmsted. Thank you. There's video first. Hypersonic weapons travel more than five times the speed of sound. At Raytheon Missiles and Defense, through digital design, partnerships with customers, and industry-leading ideas and processes, our innovation is moving even faster. We're leading development of hypersonics with end-to-end -end offensive and defensive solutions to field proven capabilities first and set the new pace of performance. Dave Scott, I am a 78 grad from this fine institution. So any opportunity that I can have to come back and speak, I take that chance. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I will tell you, 
what I look forward to when I graduated in 1978 is totally different than the environment that you all are going to be looking forward to. And part of the things I think we're going to talk about today on this panel is one of the things that our adversaries are doing better than we are, but we're catching up really, really quick. Unfortunately, we are in that catch up phase. Um, and it's not just Raytheon, it's across all of industry and all of government. And I will tell you, government is extremely interested in this weapon because of the survivability. And I'll, that's where I'll touch on. And I'm gonna probably talk more about the operational side of this as a former operator, having flown fighters for 35 years in the United States Air Force. Uh, one day I get to fly it again, maybe. But uh, I will tell you, this weapon is very, very much needed in the environment that you will be in seniors as you get out next year. And, and I will tell you, if you look at where the adversaries and the threats are and what you read about in Ukraine, you should be well aware of what this threat is. So why? I, I decided to go three things. Why do we need this? How are we gonna do it? And they're gonna spend more time on the how because of the technology piece. I'll let the, uh, the engineers here in the aero department tell you a little bit more. And when are we gonna get it? Uh, why? Survivability. Today's weapons will not survive in the environment that we currently live in and take out the adversary threats that we're going after, except in multiple numbers, which then increases the cost of kill. So as you look at cost in an environment of this, you need to think about that. That's not to say one hypersonic is going to take out the threat, but what it does in survivability, we look at five Rio stats. We look at speed. You just heard the uh, from the video. It's going to go faster than Mach 5. There are different versions of this and different weapons. One will be in the single digits above five, one will be in double digits, and one will be even much faster than that. And that's being built across industry, and there are different ranges in that. So you want to go fast. They go at a higher altitude, so they're overflying the threat. So some of those threats that you're out there, they're going to be above. They're maneuverable at the speeds that they're at. They enable them to have a very much higher G, especially in the end game, because the other thing you're doing, as you can see from the video, they're coming from about an 80 to 90 degree dive angle. Most of our weapons today that are longer ranges are coming along with probably start off sea skimming, but they got to pop up and they're, they're slow and they're coming in at a lower altitude. And then you've got RCS, just by the design of this that they'll talk a little bit more about, there's a lower RCS, so it has a harder time of being seen, and finally electronic attack. So we take that rheostat and we have developed these weapons around those kinds of things. The other thing it has, it has a longer range, so now you can stand off. You know what they can do against our weapons already, so now you're outside of those ranges, so we bring in our fourth generation aircraft. So the airplanes that are gonna be around to 2032s or 2038, F-16s, F-15s, F-18s of the Navy are gonna be able to carry this. But then you talk about loadout, you wanna have a lot of them. Our bombers will also carry them. And now you're talking about double digits. So you're gonna be carrying in a loadout, 10 to 20 of these on each of the bombers that are involved there. So now that you've, in, you've got yourself, you've got the flexibility of the weapons. The other thing that we're doing across industry and government is we want all our weapons to include this one to be multiple mission. It's not just going to be a single mission against a single target. It will be all the target sets that you can fathom. And in a different environment, we could walk you through it. But if you think about where we fight in the United States Air Force or the United States Navy, this weapon will cover that entire gamut. Um, and then finally, it's fast. So if you need to get it somewhere quickly, it will get there. So how are we gonna do this? We've been doing, as we were talking earlier, hypersonic weapons are not new. They've been around but how we develop them and how we manufacture them and how we're gonna build them is a lot different to be able to get the numbers that we need to do to catch up with the numbers that our adversaries have. So the materials are better. And it's in a very high thermal environment and depending on which weapon, you're starting to talk carbon, carbon and ink and L and I'm gonna let them talk about it. We could talk all day long about why those are important because of the temperature range and the speeds that you're going and to protect really not the, the actual platform, but the actual innards of what you need to do there because there's a lot of things going on inside of that thing. So the house of the material, then there's propulsion. We are now into the scramjet environment like you wouldn't believe and working with Northrop Grumman and Aerojet, two of the best propulsion people around, and they're working really hard to enable us to have that capability. And then the energetics, you, you still have to have a warhead. Even though this thing's gonna be coming in at Mach 2 plus, 
and it's going to do a lot of damage with the speed. The warhead is going to be needed for some of the other things that you've got out there. So the hows are now coming all together in industry. And by the way, it is an industrial base that the United States is bringing together very, very well through OSD. And then finally, when? Yesterday. We needed these weapons yesterday. So what we're doing is we're working really hard to get these out in a time frame where when you all are out there fighting the next fight, unfortunately, I hope you don't have to, or fortunately, I hope you don't have to, and we can deter the enemy with these kinds of weapons, but we need to do that. So we are working really closely, believe it or not, with commercial, because commercial industry knows how to manufacture things fast. When you go to Spirit Industry and they build the airframes of large aircraft, when you go to Collins that build brakes that have carbon carbon, you now take those folks and bring them into our environment and teach them how to. So why? Because we really, really need it. And when we really need it fast. And I will tell you, you all should be very interested in not just this weapon. And the last thing I'll say, it's not the panacea. This weapon only opens the doors for all the other weapons that you will drop so that when we go in, this will be a campaign. It will not be hypersonics. Uh, and I know tomorrow, one of the guys that I work with is going to talk to you a little bit about counter hypersonics, which, by the way, from the United States government is probably just as important as the offensive side of this. Sir, back to you. Thanks. Uh, so kind of building on that, he talked about how we've done this before. So it turns out we've been doing hypersonics since roughly 19 late 40s. Uh, the German missiles, uh, ballistic missiles were doing hypersonics. So what's different this time? Well, so first we had, we wanna get back from space. So we need to get people back from space, which means you gotta keep the inside of it cool while the vehicle gets hot. So that's that first round there. We talk about during the Apollo era, the dinosaur uh, was the name of it. It was supposed to be an intercontinental bomber with this ballistic uh, missile launch, cruise in anywhere on the globe, true global strike capability. So that kind of got rolled up into the Apollo program. And you see there, it spiked there in the uh, late 60s. And then once Apollo was successful, the interest in hypersonics really tailed off aggressively uh, because the dinosaur program, it turns out one of the reasons that they rolled a lot of those engineers into the Apollo was there was some really hard things that they realized they didn't have the science to solve. But also the national interest kind of pulled away from it. Uh, there was a few other things going on in this country in the 70s that didn't require hypersonic weapons, um, as you guys are all well aware. Um, and so the entire workforce had to go find a new job because there wasn't any money anymore in it. There was no more systems. There's no more money. So you build your expertise somewhere else. Well, then this space shuttle idea comes up because it turns out lobbing these giant rockets is wicked expensive. We need a reusable system. So now we got to have our hypersonics so that they're reusable. So you build up into the shuttle program, come up with the ability to do this reentry with the uh, uh, little shuttle tiles we're all familiar with, the big ceramic leading edges that uh, spelled the doom of the Columbia. Um, so we had some of these technologies, but they were still fairly, fairly fragile. And that buildup didn't go nearly as high but it was also 10 years later. You think about it, what happened in the last 10 years of your life? Um, you can't wait for that job to come back. You've gone on and gotten a new expertise. So what you find is a lot of new talent coming in to that again, okay? So now here we have an entirely new wave of engineers. You just about couldn't make this cycle worse timed. In terms of a 10 year cycle, people have to go find another specialty and they didn't just start in it so they can't jump back. They've already moved out and become experts in this new field that's not hypersonics. When we start realizing, actually, we want hypersonics engineers again. And so this ramping cycle at about a 10-year frequency is incredibly destructive to the talent pool for developing hypersonics. And so you end up not quite getting where you wanted because that thing you used to be able to do, you can't do because you got to start over in terms of people. Um, then there was the National Aerospace Plane, the successor to the space shuttle. The idea is I want this to have aircraft-like operations from ground to orbit, single stage. Uh, it turned out that was a bigger bite than everybody realized at the time. And so it, as you've noticed, we don't have a National Aerospace Plane because it was canceled. It was canceled in the 90s. And then things got real quiet in hypersonics because it was too hard. And what else happened there around 1990 that suddenly made us not care nearly as much. This whole global reconstruction of power thing, um, yeah, kind of a big deal. So that interest wasn't there. There was no 
national existence level adversary out there. And so there wasn't the weapon drive that we talk about now. There wasn't the uh, space drive that we were talking about in the previous two waves of this. It wasn't there. So what ended up happening was it went into an almost minimum level of effort. Um, so when I got into hypersonics uh, was in 2009, uh, so this is, as you see, a little bit of a little bit of a tail current kind of trying to come back up there. That was with NASA and the Air Force trying to figure out how to do hypersonics again. The technology was maturing, coming out of NASP. A lot of the legacies were things that problems that were realized in NASP and were worked at in the labs and developed that technology. You get out there to 2009. So I, I uh, was a second lieutenant uh, commissioned through ROTC um, and uh, uh, went out to the Air Force Research Lab and worked on hypersonic modeling out there. Um, and we were working on X-51, which was the first demonstration of a cruise missile type air breathing, we call it, hypersonic weapon. Um, that program was going on when I got there in 2009. It flew shortly after I left in 2012. Um, but again, the successor to that wasn't ready. There was no successor that they started building into. So once again, we do this cycle again where we were like, okay, X-51, there were some bumps with high fly, or, uh, you know, we got some challenges, we got no national level competitor. And the part that was really frustrating is in the research lab, we were watching the Chinese and the Russians start building this technology based on us, based on what we had done in NASP, because there was a lot of public literature out there, it was basic science stuff, and we could see them using it. And the conversations that we were having in the lab are the same conversations that are being had at the highest levels of power at the end of my career, now that I'm wearing a slightly different rank. Um, and it's just kind of frustrating from my perspective. Like, we had this, we knew this was a problem, but what was going on for most of my career? Counterinsurgency ops. How much does survivability matter in counterinsurgency operations? It's a very, for a person, very, it matters a lot. For a very, very different set of problems, right? You're not talking about integrated air defense systems. You're not talking about over the horizon radars and anti-ship weaponry and some of these heavy systems that are you know, counter state level attack systems. Uh, and so anyways, that's kind of the, the flow there. Uh, so really what we were talking about is hypersonics comes in two main flavors. We got the boost gliders and we've got the air breathers. So my background in research is on the air breathers. Uh, Dr. Hassan is doing computational research on the air breathing engines uh, for the Air Force Research Lab. Um, the other one is the boost glider. So these look kind of like your classical ballistic missiles. You launch them up out of the atmosphere, but you don't go quite as high. And then you pull up and kind of sit in the very thin top of the atmosphere, kind of maybe skip along a little bit, but you're in the air enough you can maneuver, um, which creates another interesting problem when we go into this. Uh, they're going to be talking more about the, the challenges in these particular things. So I'm actually going to talk about why, why we care. So this is an interesting picture from a briefing I got the other day from uh, the Air Force Research Lab in a, uh, that they were presenting uh, out of a NATO working group. And it says that if, uh, uh, let's see, where's the laser on this guy? There. Nope, it's not up there. Uh -huh. Okay, so too, many, too much buttons. Um, so if you've got a uh, hypersonic boost glide weapon being launched out of Russia, somewhere in the neighborhood of Kazakhstan, um, it's gonna fly for a while and it's not until 10 minutes before impact. So that's what those green rings are, is the minute, effectively two minute rings before impact. You can see that outer ring of green touches both Oslo, Paris, and Athens. And you can't tell which one it's going for at 10 minutes before impact. And it's already in the air and it's already committed to one of them. And you don't know which one. And there's nothing you can do about it in that time frame because you have to realize where it's going, get something turned on, locked in, up to altitude. And so we look at our classic ballistic missile interceptors. They're used to having 20 plus minutes of time or having something that's got a known trajectory. You pick it up on the radar, you know where it's going. You just got to get your asset up there to get in front of it and blow it up. That isn't possible when you've got this kind of maneuverability. So from a survivability standpoint, this is why we see in the news, Putin is talking about having hypersonic weapons on ships in the Atlantic, um, in Kaliningrad. Uh, these weapons are in Europe, operational, to try and hold Europe at, at bay um, and make it so that he can effectively blackmail Europe by holding all of it at risk with one set of weapon or any part of it at risk. Not all of it, this was your back to your, you're not gonna use it as your only weapon, but you can hold any one part of it at risk. Um, so, and you take this, this uh, to the next level, I'll wrap up with 
what about if you fly all the way around the world and then start this maneuver? Because remember I said you go kind of into the thin parts of the atmosphere. Well, what if you're just above that and you just have to slow down a little and you drop into this hypersonic regime? Well, that's quite terrifying because now satellites go all over the entire Earth fairly quickly. We watch about you know, the International Space Station ground track, right? It comes around every 94 minutes, it goes around the Earth and kind of processes around. So that means they could launch a hypersonic weapon and just let it march around until it gets where it wants and drops in. And it looks like a satellite until it begins that final trajectory, which is at 10 minutes out from the impact. So the Chinese demonstrated this system last year. Uh, so is this real? Absolutely. Do our adversaries have it? Definitely. Is it terrifying? Probably wise to be a little concerned uh, because this can fundamentally change what does deterrence look like when your adversary could potentially be floating these things up there and then bring them back in all at once. Uh, so with that, talk a little bit about the uh, technology. Of it. Okay. Um, so I'm Ez Hassan. I work at the Air Force Research Lab. I'm actually in the uh, high speed systems division, the propulsion, uh, propulsion branch, right? So I deal uh, specifically with uh, the scramjet flow path, right? And um, as, as this slide shows, right, uh, there's just so many scientific challenges in understanding um, hypersonics in general, wh whether it's a boost light weapon, right, or an ear, uh, a hypersonic air breathing uh, weapon. I, I, the air breathing weapon has the extra complexity of having an engine, uh, a scramjet engine, and I. Uh, Anybody knows what a scramjet stands for? Right. So scramjet is, is, is basically a ramjet, but the combustion happens supersonically. So it's a supersonic um, combustion ramjet, which means that uh, in order for you to ignite that engine, right, you're trying to uh, <clears throat> achieve ignition in supersonic flow and mock more than one. So imagine, you know, try, trying to light a match in a in a hurricane or a tornado or a really big storm and that would be even easier right so you can just imagine this is, this is some of the challenges is can we keep that in, uh, that engine lit right uh, and if we light that engine remember it's all one piece right there's no moving parts so if you light that engine uh, there is a big there's a probability that you're going to push the flow outside the inlet of the engine and now you cannot get uh, enough air into your scramjet and uh, basically your, you know, the whole um, engine stops working, right? So many, many challenges that we're facing. And unfortunately, we don't have a very good um, understanding of physics in the problem. See, when we teach in um, aerodynamics, right? When we teach the theory, we usually make assumptions. So we say, okay, uh, let's assume that the flow um, is laminar, means it, it doesn't have all the, you know, turbulent and all the eddies going on. Uh, we can't do that here because it's a very highly turbulent problem. Let's assume it's inviscid. It doesn't have um, a boundary layer. We cannot do this here. As you can see, when we're going in, there is an interaction between the boundary layer and the shocks. Let's assume it's low speed. Of course, we cannot assume that because it's a high speed system with lots of shocks interaction, interacting with the boundary layer um, in a turbulent manner. And on top of that, you have to deal with combustion. Okay, combustion. We understand combustion uh, on a scientific level very well for hydrogen. Okay, when you're talking about hydrocarbons, uh, understanding I'm, a lot of you took chemistry, right? We cannot just say it's fuel plus oxygen equals um, CO2 plus water, right? We have to go through the kinetic steps, all those detailed kinetic steps. Why? Because um, the timescales, how fast things are moving inside your scramjet are actually um, of the same, same timescales as, so, as those little kinetic steps. So we cannot just ignore them and say fuel plus oxygen equals uh, CO2 plus water. Unfortunately, we have to go through very detailed, you know, here's one molecule hitting this molecule to split up. And this is how much time it takes for it to do that. And then it hits this other molecule. So you can just think about the complexity of the problem 
um, and, um, and, and how to deal with it. And that's why, you know, I, I deal usually with computational fluid dynamics, which is trying to simulate things like that, right? It's trying to simulate the scramjet engine uh, the flow path inside that for two purposes, right? The first purpose is, okay, can we have, can we simulate this and have a design tool, right? Instead of an experiment, let's make a simulation. And based on the simulation, we can understand how much thrust, how well this engine works, right? And, uh, and hopefully uh, we can make a better design as a design tool. Uh, but more importantly, as a understanding of physics tools, can we use a simulation to understand the physics inside our scram, um, um, our scramjet combustor. So can go to the next, next slide. <laughs> so, so how can we do that? Uh, through computational fluid dynamics. Computational fluid dynamics is basically uh, trying to simulate the entire uh, interaction process with the air and the gases in, inside your combustor and a scramjet. Uh, unfortunately, currently the, the uh, state of the art, right? You can you can simulate an entire combustor uh, in about a day using about five thousand CPU hours, um, but unfortunately, it's a more it's a very it has a very limited uh, predictive capability. We use it in the industry. That's probably how you know we can we can get uh, we can simulate all of these uh, weapons that we're able to have at the moment, uh, but we cannot do it without experiment, right? We have to uh, rely on experiments, rely on a lot of calibration. We can do an experiment very close to the simulation and then calibrate the simulation that way uh, to try to give us uh, useful information. But even that is not 100% guaranteed, right? Uh, so the talk of, okay, can we just stop experiments and do simulation? Unfortunately, it's not, it cannot happen today very reliably. Uh, now, this is the applied method. Uh, we can do more high fidelity simulations and many of you may have heard of this before. Um, unfortunately, uh, just looking at a small corner flow, right? Just the boundary layers in two corners, no combustion, nothing. Uh, just a one and a half inch by one and a half inch um, to truly resolve all those, you know, turbulent structures that are occurring in the boundary layer. Uh, this is a simulation that cost about 5 million CPU hours. And again, you can talk about the approximate cost of these simulations, right? How much do they cost? Oh, everybody thinks simulations are much more, uh, less expensive than experiment. They're going to, they're going to replace it. But in reality, just this corner, uh, you know, if you talk about the cost about two, 2.4 cents per CPU hours, that's an average approximate cost um, based on an Amazon prediction, but I think it's actually pretty conservative with how much we spend here in the government. So this simulation, I think this would cost about $120,000, right? Uh, again, no chemistry, nothing at all, but it can help us understand the physics a little bit better, maybe make better uh, simulations in the past in the more applied side. Now, when you add chemistry, right? So here's another simulation. I don't know if this video uh, will work or not, but here's another simulation of ignition. Remember, we talked about ignition in a scramjet. Um, so the video is not working, but we talked about an ignition scramjet. So this one actually includes all the little steps for the chemistry. And in, uh, in reality, not it's a reduced model, not the thousands and thousands of steps. This only has 32 steps. And this is a simulation for ignition that lasts for 12 milliseconds, okay? And it's not even a very high, it's not the highest fidelity you can get. And uh, the cost of those 12 milliseconds is 50 million CPU hours. So how much is the approximate cost for that? $1.2 million, okay? So we're far from, unfortunately, we're far from predictive physical uh, capability for these type of flows. Uh, but we do these simulations and we have big computers that uh, work for the DoD and we use them to make these simulations to try to understand our physics better. So that way we can improve the, um, uh, come up with models that can work and more efficiently for us, right? So again, it's a, um, even though we, we are making these weapons and we are, our physical understanding on, on a basic level still needs 
uh, a lot of improvement. And this is kind of what uh, you will be hopefully working on in the next years and uh, improving it and making it better. That's all. So somebody asked a question about prediction versus actual, and, and I'd like to answer that since I have done both. Uh, so I don't think it's as bad. And, and by the way, I'm not a scientist. I did graduate with an engineering degree here, but but it's but I will tell you, your engineers out there in this world that are doing this across industry are doing some pretty amazing predictive analysis in the digital environment, because that's where we're headed, that in two of our flights, the actual analysis and the actual flight were exactly the same. So I, we're, we're, I hate being you know, doom and gloom. It's not all doom and gloom. There's a lot of great work being done to predict this in the simulations and in the, in the wind tunnels. The only thing I would tell you is we don't have enough wind tunnels. Uh, but someone asked, yeah, I, I probably already answered it. I, I just wanna make sure you all understand this is being done and the analysis is pretty damn good. And you guys are gonna be doing it in one to two to three years. So a little bit actually on, on that one, you talk about the analysis is pretty darn good. In 2009, 10 timeframe, the analysis wasn't so good. So the incredible amounts of work that we're putting in between now and then, or then and now, uh, when we were doing these projections, uh, some of the missions had catastrophic failures because the models were just fundamentally mispredicting the flow. Um, so you talk about these progress in 15 years, it's coming leaps and bounds. Um, yeah, the, the computer on your desk is nothing. <laughs> the slide rule I had is kind of the, the degree of jump from what you're, where you are to where the computer on your desk is to where these HPCs are. And I will tell you, faces like Lawrence Livermore and the amount of computer power they have is pretty doggone amazing. So again, um, so again, I think we've done like I, I don't disagree at all. We've done a great job with this, and 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 big part of it is the um, uh, the synchronization between wind tunnels and and computers, right? So a lot of the success uh, that we've made is on the calibration side. Again, it, for more, you know, we would look at the wind tunnels, we see what they do. Uh, we can do a ground test and then and then take those constant or these calibration constants and apply them for a flight test. And a lot of times they are very, very successful, right? That is very, very successful. Um, but, and this is great. And that's what we're doing today. We don't, on a fundamental level, understand why that works, right? Why these calibrations from the ground test work on the flight test. And we definitely cannot just dump our wind tunnel at the moment and just say, do a simulation. If our simulation was at a level, uh, if we were at a level of a physical understanding um, of, of, of all the <clears throat> phenomena that occur in a scramjet, then we don't need the wind tunnels, right? I mean, that's what we thought in the past. We thought we don't need the wind tunnels. We can just do simulations. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do this today. Uh, as far as the adversaries go, Yes, they they do have uh, they have improved through you know the past ten or so years. Uh, their computers are just as big as our computers, right? And um, and the issue with this, sure. Well, the problem is most of the basic science, uh, like Colonel Olmsted mentioned, uh, is out in the open literature, and they use this. And they are kind of on par of where we are right now. I don't know if they are better than us, uh, but they're probably, I would say they're probably on par where we are right now, simulation wise. The entire country of China or Russia, two test ranges. Start looking at our infrastructure in the industrial base and what they can do at the speed. When they have a failure, they don't spend a year figuring out what the failure was. They fly the next one and then they fix the one before. So they're willing to go ahead and fly their next flight, even though it might have the same problem. They're hoping it doesn't. Hope's not a great strategy. I'm sure you learned that in school here. Uh, but the fact of the matter is they're testing and learning faster 
We are doing that now. I, I will tell you, we are learning. And then I will be totally honest, 35 years in the call. We were very busy doing the right thing and protecting the young men and women that were serving our country and doing what we asked them to do while they looked at what we were doing and how we did it and what the future fight would be. And that's what this is all about. What is the future fight? We kind of sat back, rested on our laurels, pays dividends after 91 and the wall falls down and we do a great job in Gulf War I. Uh, so there's a lot of lessons learned for you all to take. You know, Sun Tzu says it very well. You know, you learn from your history. Sometimes we don't learn as well as we should. So I will tell you, they have the infrastructure, they have the environment, they have the will. It's not that we didn't have the will. We just were focused on other things at the time. We're going to get there. I guarantee I, I can tell you right now, and it's not just Raytheon. Industry knows what needs to be done. Uh, our boss walked out of a room with, uh, with a four-star general in the Army, and they thank industry, not just Raytheon, but all industry, because the reason we're not in Ukraine right now is because the weapons we were developing are enabling Ukraine to do the things that they're doing. That's where we got to get back to. Does that make sense? I'll add one other thought to that. Um, looking over the past decade, the success rates that they're getting are pretty high compared to what we had. Um, X-51 had a 50% failure rate. A lot of our hypersonic programs in the US have, have been around a 50% failure rate. Um, the last couple of years are starting to change. Um, we had a pretty high failure rate on things like Arrow. Uh, we had failure, a uh, 50% failure rate on X-51. As we start getting into Hawk, the next generation hypersonic cruise missile, um, both contractors' solutions have succeeded. Um, it wasn't a 50% failure rate. Arrow just had a fully successful or a successful mission. Um, so we're starting to get our feet under us. One of the things I'll say is that we have been very timid with 35 years in the Gulf. We have not been as aggressive about pushing. The, the cost to individuals for failure in the U.S. has been very high. Um, so you didn't want to fail, individuals and organizations. And so you, you, tried, you, you were very, very tentative, which ended up actually resulting in more failures because you never tried. Um, and so when we talk about these numbers, it's starting to change. Um, An industry has done an extraordinary job of figuring out this new tempo. How do we get these done? So we have a workforce that knows how to develop, how to test. So we don't have dumb little failures, like some fin came loose in flight and was a total loss before you even learned anything. Um, Cause these kinds of things happen. Um, and so I think that's one of these differences is that uh, authoritarian governments are nice because they don't get a lot of public criticism or they don't listen to it anyways. Um, Right, and so I, I think they were, they put the throttle down 15 years before us on some of these things. And um, so by the time we saw it, they'd gotten through some of these bumpy starts that we're just now getting through. Okay, uh, I'll keep it short. I think we were supposed to talk for about seven minutes and before we took questions and it's been over 30. So yeah, I've been a few questions along the way. My name's uh, Charles Hoke. Um, while I don't sound it, I am a researcher in the Australian University of New South Wales, and I teach at the Australian Defense Force Academy. Um, although it doesn't sound it, I like Dell, uh, Colonel Olmsted. I was a second lieutenant from ROTC as well, and I did my first tour at the Air Force Research Lab working on X-43, which was the one before X-51. And then I spent four years at Raytheon working on an anti-ballistic missile missile. <laughs> so I'm just gonna go through this quick. A uh, bit of this is a plug for what we're doing in Australia and I'll talk about one of the other technical challenges, but I wanna get to questions, so I'll go quick. Um, Australia really punches above its weight in hypersonics. In fact, I think you could make the argument that after China, Russia, and the US, Australia is the next world leader in hypersonics. And a lot of that has to do with one simple fact is that there is a test range in Australia that is larger than the size of Massachusetts called the Woomera test range. And so you can see here is a list of all of, a lot of the actual flight tests um, that we've done there, high fire, high cause, high shot, um, hex supply. Um, and a lot of these are not, you know, they weren't cruise missiles, they sh we shoot them up and then they come down and on the way down, 
they go hypersonic. And that's when we turn on us, we turn on the scramjet, we start collecting all our data. But you can trace back the lineage of X51 to a lot of these tests. Um, and so we're also doing, I'm working on, we have wind tunnels there where we actually drop. We'll take a, 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 a hypersonic vehicle, we'll drop it with into a wind tunnel and then we'll turn on the flow and that vehicle will fly in the wind tunnel for about 100 milliseconds, which is actually fairly long test time for a hypersonic vehicle. And we can actually get dynamic stability data from 100 millisecond Mach 6 plus wind tunnel test. And so these are some of the capabilities that we have in Australia that actually in some cases are pretty unique to Australia. So I just wanted to give that plug for Australia. I'll talk about one other um, technical challenge that is a good example of hypersonics. Um, thermal structural failure. I, I am a, what I, my research is in thermal fluid structure interaction. And so uh, my, Dr. Cummings, who's a world renowned researcher in hypersonics, his motto for hypersonics is it's the heat, stupid. That's really the hard part about hypersonics. And so you think about the F-111 had aluminum. I have spent 10 years in Australia, so I say aluminum now. Um, to the SR-71 is titanium. We went to the X-15, which was Inconel, which we a uh, high temperature metal. But once you get above around Mach 6 or so, you can't build things out of metal anymore. They will just melt. And so, of course, the shuttle, we went to the thermal protection system, but that thermal protection system ceramic had to be repaired after every flight. And it's very expensive and bulky and not uh, cost effective for a vehicle. So. Now we're doing more advanced things, but material science is, is definitely one of the biggest challenges that we face in hypersonics, and it's because of the heat. Um, if you click the next one, uh, the X-15, we learned a lot about thermal fluid structure in the X-15. So I won't go through it all, but um, the skins would buckle on the X-15 and rip off. So we had to change the way we did that. We had a, a shockwave interaction where a shockwave hit a part of the X-15 and nearly burned off, did burn off parts of the structure and they almost lost that X-15. Uh, that's in the upper right. In the lower right is a more recent uh, German experiment called the Chefex. And it's hard to see, but the fin on the top is so hot that it's starting to deform. And that can obviously cause a loss of control on re-entry. So if you go to the next slide, um, what makes hypersonics so hard? We know we've been doing hypersonics for 25 years, but what we haven't been doing is flying things at hypersonic speeds for a long time. And so if you look at the fluids, turbulence is every millisecond, you have changes. The structural dynamics might be every 10th of a second. The thermal properties change every second, but we're flying for a thousand seconds. So you can imagine if we have just a panel on a control surface, that thing heats up, when it heats up, it becomes what we call compliant, which means it changes its shape. And when it changes its shape, the aerodynamics change, which changes the heating on the panel, which changes the shape on the panel. And so when I worked at Raytheon, we had an aerodynamics branch, we had a structures branch, we had a thermal branch. We all sat in different parts of the, of the building and there was some you know, tension between the groups. And we've really got to get through that because everything is all the same now. And that's uh, another, and we're, I assume since I, I left Raytheon in 2012 and I hope it's a lot better there now. Yeah, okay. So I'll leave it at that. We'll take questions now, I think. Hello, gentlemen. First of all, thank you for coming and thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Um, you know, after booster separation, a hypersonic glide vehicle no longer has like this massive plume behind it with, the, with its booster, right? I know you mentioned at the beginning of this briefing that they also have a very minimal radar cross-section. Um, so we spend a lot of these conversations about hypersonics, uh, about how we aren't able to shoot them down because of how maneuverable they are. Um, so it seems like we're putting the cart before the horse though. So how do we even detect hypersonics in the first place if they have such a low radar cross-section and IR signature? So they're hot and they're coming in at a very, very, you know, the altitudes are coming in. As, and, and so the, so one is you have EOIR from a different environment. So remember, we're on all domain force in the Air Force from terrestrial all the way up to 
says lunar, but let's talk about what we've got in the, in the uh, space environment. So they do come in hot. If you look at, if you study the Missile Defense Agency and what they have done in, avail, in, in being able to see things, by the way, NORAD Northcom is very much involved in that. They're able to see that. So we're taking what we've already learned from the Missile Defense Agency. We're taking what we've learned in the air dominance region where fighters actually are maneuverable. And how do we set ourselves up for what you all now are calling the kill web, what I call the kill chain, tying those pieces together. Uh, you've probably heard about the laurel tranche and the, the truck layer that they're putting up into that environment. Everything is designed about the kill chain, JADC2 and command and control. The government has failed in command and control, in my opinion, and I ran Air Force requirements, so you can blame it on me, in that we spent all the money on boats and planes and platforms, and now we're getting smart because command and control, because of the ranges that you're going to have to see things, cue things, put a basket, and then kill it. Uh, I will tell you, across industry and, and defense, counter hypersonics is probably just as important to some people, more important to NORAD Northcom, if you talk to them and what they need to do with homeland defense, probably much more important than the offensive side. Uh, so you need them both, and we're working them, and I guarantee you the industry's got a way ahead. And we just, again, it comes down to, you saw the cost. Unfortunately, things do cost money. These are now exquisite solutions. It's not like I'm going to go shoot down a bomber. Not that hard if you can get close enough, uh, but it's, it's going after some. So the work is being done. The kill webs are being developed, and the concepts are, are out there. We just got to make sure in the JADC2 ring, the Joint Air Dominance Command and Control, the three services plus the agencies, all the agencies get together, and we don't have stovepipes. So probably didn't answer everything, but I, I, what I'm going to guarantee you is it's on the minds of just about everybody that I talk to in the building. How are you going to kill it? Do we really need them offensively? Well, I, I think you do for deterrence. Remember, this is also a deterrent weapon. If we can deter the enemy from doing something with something, that's a good thing. By the way, the defensive side is also a deterrent because if they can't use their weapon, and, and you all understand the first and second island chain, and we won't get into comments, but that I, I think General Wilsbach is going to come out and talk to this organization here when you have your culminating event of that exercise. Listen to what he has to say about how that fight's going to occur, because I think it'll be at a different level. Good. Thank you. I like operational questions. <laughs> Cadet Third Class, Liam Champagne here. I have a question on if uh, multi-stage uh, mid-flight uh, fuel uh, containers have been thought of um, when designing hypersonics and also what are some things that the uh, hypersonic communities are working on to fix uh, plasma warping uh, or at least like the missiles or glide vehicles becoming like basically plasma within hypersonic stage within a hypersonic stage Sounds like an engineer's question. So I, I can certainly try to answer the second part. Um, at certain Mach numbers, plasma is just part of the game. Um, I don't, the vehicles don't necessarily turn to plasma, but the air does, right? So we talk about, there's kind of at low speeds, which some of the cruise scramjets will operate in the speeds where you still are working in air. But once you go fast enough, you start to dissociate the air into different molecules. And then eventually you, those molecules start to react. So it's almost like the inside the scramjet problem where the air outside the vehicle can start to have chemical reactions. And then once you go even faster than that, the air can ionize, which means the electrons are stripped off and you end up with, no longer with a gas, but with a plasma. And that can have a lot of, um, I probably won't even mention a lot of them, but certainly the materials and heating and thermal fluid structure, trying to make the structure so that it doesn't deform in such a way that it either fails or becomes uncontrollable is an active area of research. The stuff I'm doing now, we're looking at those very sort of problems. Um, I don't have an answer for you about how we fix it yet. <laughs> Maybe some of the more operational vehicles have got some of the thing, but even things like if you have a seeker on the weapon, and your air is now a charged plasma, the seeker might not work through that. The solutions to these things are not something that I can just tell you, um, but 
the problems are known and they're working. Now the multi-stage, I'm not quite sure what the first question was. Maybe Colonel Holmes said, yeah. So similar to how rockets have multi-stage uh, platforms where the first two rockets go off uh, in terminal phase and then they drop and et cetera, et cetera. Is that same process ever looked into when developing hypersonic glide vehicles? So the vehicles, both of the air breathing and the boost glide are multi-stage. Yeah, they are both two, they're both two stages. Cause yeah, I think one of the gentlemen said for an air breather, you got to get it to a point in space at a, at a speed that you can ignite the scramjet. So that is what the, your, your first stage will do that. In a boost glide, the reason you have the first stage because it gets you to the altitude and a boost glide has no, it's just gliding and doing its, its, its job by bouncing off of the atmosphere to get its range. So there are multi-stages. Have we looked at more than one, two stages? Absolutely, when you start looking at different ranges that you're looking at there. But again, that comes into cost. And then the other thing it does, it changes the platforms. Now, when you put a third stage, you're probably looking at a ground launch or a, a sea launch type thing out of a VLS. Yes, sir, thank you so much. And the other thing with plasma, I will say, think about it on the defensive side. If I can disrupt it, I can do some things too. So there's an offensive piece that we're, you know, what you talked about, I agree with the, uh, the, the professor over here, it, 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 where it is, it's not impacting as much as you might think, but if I can disrupt it, then I can cause some type of movement in the, in the platform. And if I get it to skew, guess what? It's going to tumble out of space. So that's part of the defensive side, is just, if you think about it. How, how do you do that? And what can you do that with? And I'll leave that to your imagination. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Hi, sir. Uh, my name is Jake, or uh, all of you. Um, so I'm an MSS major, and I understand things like gliding and shooting rockets and you know basics like this right but half the stuff on that slide is way over my head uh probably because i barely passed arrow but that aside um what is like a major takeaway that we need to know as soon-to-be lieutenants who are going to be tacticians in a particular field um, what is the takeaway for hypersonics and and what things do we need to be thinking about and discussing so as you start looking at weapons, and I'm not just going to say hypersonics, any weapons, how do you believe as you learn and go through the different schools when you're out there operation, employ them? And each of them is employed differently. You know, a paveway laser guided bomb is absolutely done completely different than a hypersonic. So how do you take all of these capabilities that are out there in our inventory across all three services? and get that into the ATO so that we are fighting a fight tonight together. So if I could say anything about anything, think joint. We have spent a lot of times building joint and then going stovepipes. We will not win a war in the Indo-PACOM in the littoral maritime regime without the Navy. So how are we gonna fight with the Navy? So my, my ask for you as you walk out as young lieutenants, get us, smart as you can in the environment you are, in your environment. Each one of you are gonna go somewhere different. Some of you are gonna go be pilots, some of you are gonna be navigators, some of you are gonna be engineers. Figure out where it is. I, I see a command chief right here. Grab the smartest NCO that you can find, hip them to your, to your hip, and listen to what they have to say and get the smart people to talk to you about what you're doing. And you, know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. You, know, I, you talk about arrow going over your head. I, I resemble that. But all of a sudden, I've got a no arrow. And so I, at my very young age, I'm still learning. So don't ever forget what you're doing out there. And by the way, it's for the safety and the world that we live in today. I would just, I would just add to that, don't even just think joint, but think international. I apologize. There are international partners up there. Different Tom Swain. Uh, quick question, back more to the operational side. So first of all, thank you very much. This is enlightening. The technical complexities, I think, are fascinating. We talked a lot about the delivery vehicle. Could you share a little bit with us more about the energetics or the kinetics? What, if anything, changes with the weapons payload? Can we assume single warhead, multiple warheads, conventional, nuclear, sensor capability? Can we even talk about it? So I won't even go to nuclear. 
that's something I'll let somebody else go to. Um, so the energetics, the, the warheads, they're not big. You know, they're, they're not the size of a, so they're not going to sink a ship. Uh, but if you think about the weapon in the angle of dive that it's coming in at Mach 2 plus at 8,000 pounds and the energy in it will create as it goes through decks or it goes through buildings or it does whatever it needs to do. And it will have a warhead that will do what it needs to do on the, uh, on the top side. If you are looking at mission kills, these are the kind of weapons that will be mission kills. What that then enables you to do is you take out picket ships. So you take out all of the war fighting capability of whatever nation you're fighting against. And then you're worried about the amphibs that are bringing the, the troops in. Now you can use your less survivable weapons because they aren't defended against as well. So it's that campaign mindset. How do I take out the, the, the hard ones? And then how do I use the rest of the weapons to do that? So it's, it is a mixture of energetics and kinetics. And I will tell you, this thing will go through four decks of a ship. And I don't know about you, I've been on a boat. If the boat's on fire and there's holes in the boat, even though it's not sinking, I'm probably more worried about getting the boat out of the fight than I am worried about employing weapons. Uh, so that's part of it is how do you get them to think differently in the war fight? Is that? One thing I'll say about the other weapons things, uh, if you look at a lot of our adversaries, they're very being very open about their hypersonic weapons are nuclear capable. Uh, one of the key points is this doesn't have a large warhead. There's other weapons that also don't have a large warhead. A W-80 is not a very big device. Um, and so could you stuff a cruise missile class nuclear weapon inside of a hypersonic reentry vehicle? It's probably smaller and lighter. So our adversaries are openly threatening with that. The U.S. has been very clear that that is not our intent. Um, but that's why our adversaries are pushing this is because if they develop a conventional capability, they want us to know, I have the ability to put a nuke in here. My nukes are smaller. Um, so could it be multiples? Uh, that uh, fan, you, there's no reason that you couldn't have something put energy in and go out multiple legs of that fan. Um, so all the things that you worry about with all these other things, plus the fact that it's high speed maneuverable. Um, there's nothing about it that makes it incompatible with those other lanes. Yeah, and some of the hypersonic flight bodies are smaller. And what I will tell you is in the Army version with the diameter of the weapon they have for the booster, you, with, with a shroud, you could probably put multiple glide bodies in there. Uh, are we looking at it? Absolutely, we're looking at it. But right now we're working on the, we're working on getting to where we are with parity with our adversaries. That's the first thing we got to get to. Then we'll start you guys and the innovation of the smart brains of the young folks will take us to the next level. I'm in here real quick. Uh, panel's going well. We're loving all the questions. we got some extra time. So what I'm going to do is we're going to take two more questions and then we'll uh, wrap it up from there. Thank you. All right. Sweet. I promise you'll get the second question. Hi, gentlemen. Uh, Cadet First Class, Matt Hamilton. So as someone who's studied ops design a lot more than the engineering design process, uh, it's easy to get sucked into this idea that there's only, there's this one thing that we could solve or there's this Achilles heel um, that if we just had this one thing, this eureka moment, um, everything would be better. Is there such thing as that in the hyper, hypersonic war, or realm? Propulsion is the hardest thing to do in all rocket motor stuff. So if we can figure out the different types of scramjets, by the way, as you're out there, solid fuel ramjets, liquid fuel ramjets, highly loaded grain burn rate enhancement. If we can figure out how to get our propulsion at a cost and a manufacturing ability in the future, then, then we will meet, because the other things we're doing you know, is Moore's law. Propulsion is not Moore's law. It, you, you need more fuel, you need more mass fraction. It, it is what it is. We are really moving out in avionics and chips and all of those things. But I, I will tell you, when I get wake up at night and when I worry about things, is did that rocket motor test that we're gonna test tomorrow go well? And there's so much going on in that world because they're cramming a lot of different ways to get as much energy into that 
outer mole line. And if you think about it, if we're going to put them inside of an F-35, you're basically looking at about a 13 and a half inch diameter and about, let's just say 162 inches, somewhere in there. If you only got so much energetics, it's only going to go so far. How do I shrink everything else to enable that to go further? So propulsion keeps me up at night. You're the propulsion guy. Agreed. <laughs> I mean, a, a full scale uh, flight vehicle wind tunnel would be nice. For oh, hypersonics yeah. at full scale. Infrastructure. I actually think the infrastructure may be the big problem. You talk about testing these uh, systems a lot of these booster tests we're doing are bolted to a stand sitting on the ground. It's not at altitude, it's not in a vacuum chamber, it's not at high speeds, it's not. So I think, talk about how the Chinese are doing it differently, have, building up that test hardware and that national capability is one of those things that if we're, we don't get it right. We're going into wind tunnel on another, another, another program that hasn't been used in 60 years. Go figure. You all here at Yusafa, over wherever I'm pointing in the wrong, have probably better wind tunnels than some of the places at Langley and the other places in Tennessee that we have. It's infrastructure. That's the other, yeah, infrastructure. How can we test faster so we can learn and get the things out there? Test? Oh, wow. All right, good afternoon, gentlemen. I finally got my mic. Um, I'm CTC Jackson, and I'm also a nuclear weapons miner. Um, so my question is, as far as creating nuclear hypersonics, we've talked a lot at an unclassified level about um, the fragility of the plutonium pits and high explosives, which cause that fission reaction. So with the maneuverability at such high Gs of hypersonics providing that advantage, with the fragility of that system, does it necessarily um, still maintain that advantage if they can't maneuver as well? So... Again, again, be careful because we're not classified, but in, in the ballistic missile defense, you, you kind of know what we can do. And, and while we may not have enough systems in tunnel in, in holes on the ground, um, we, we, we can take care of things that aren't maneuvering. And, and across the layer defense that I know, again, NORAD Northcom, if you think about what they're doing from a perspective of in close, medium range and long range, for easily seen and easily is not easy. It's still not an easy button. So if you're if you're putting yourself in an environment where I can track you, I am going to kill you. Which is what we do well. Does that answer your question? Okay. So I will add one thing. Those arcs that we had that branched from Athens to Oslo, those are not pulling extraordinary G's. That's a big turn radius. Um, so. What's that? That was a 5G turn. Um, so it's. I can still do 5Gs. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it's not like you're pulling 25Gs to do that corner. Okay, thank you. Awesome. All right. We'll uh, go ahead and end it there. I just want to say thank you, gentlemen, for uh, coming and spending time with us. And again, obviously, lots of questions and a lot of interest in this uh, topic area and where we're going in the future. So uh, a small, again, token of our appreciation for your time and wisdom that you uh, espouse with us. Uh, we got a small parting gift for each one of you. Thank you. All right, let's give them a warm uh, round of applause. Thank you so much. All right, so the next uh, plan is we're gonna take a 10 minute break. Get everybody uh, a little bit of, again, uh, stretch break here. Um, please be back in seats uh, no later than 15, let's say, we'll just call it, uh, we'll just call it 1520 at the latest. And we'll get started. What we're gonna do is we'll have a closing video for everybody at that point. Thank you. Please don't go too far and uh, join us for the last uh, section here that we got. Thank you. <laughs> 